Hi, I'm Matt Binnaker, the Director of Clinical Virology and Vice Chair Practice in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic. In this month's hot topic, my colleague Dr. Rajiv Pruthi will discuss different types of hemophilia along with their pathologic basis. He'll also cover various types of factor assays, such as one stage and chromogenic factor assays for diagnosis and management of hemophilia. I hope you enjoy this month's hot topic, and I want to personally thank you for allowing Mayo Clinic the opportunity to partner in your patient's healthcare. Thank you very much for the introduction. I will be presenting information on the chromogenic factor 8 and factor 9 assays and their impact on the diagnosis and management of hemophilia. I have no relevant disclosures. At the end of this presentation, the audience will be able to recall the types of bleeding disorders, state the types of hemophilia, review the different types of one stage and chromogenic factor VIII and factor IX assays, and discuss the roles and limitations of factor assays in the diagnosis and management of hemophilia. Congenital bleeding disorders may be categorized into coagulation factor deficiencies and platelet disorders. The most common coagulation factor deficiency related bleeding disorder is von Willebrand disease, a deficiency of von Willebrand factor. This affects approximately 1% of the general population. Hemophilia A affects approximately 1 in 10,000 and hemophilia B affects approximately 1 in 30,000 live male births. Hemophilia C, which is factor 11 deficiency, affects about 1 in 100,000 of the U.S. general population, but up to 8% of individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. The prevalence of platelet disorders is not accurately quantified. They are rare, but also likely underdiagnosed. Hemophilia A and hemophilia B are X-linked recessive bleeding disorders. This means that males are affected and females are asymptomatic carriers, about 90% of whom do not have bleeding symptoms. Approximately 10% do have low enough factor levels and do experience bleeding. Severity of hemophilia is based on baseline coagulation factor activity levels. Severe hemophilia patients have a factor eight or factor nine activity level of less than 1%, whereas in moderate hemophilia, the activity levels range from one to 5%, and with mild hemophilia, it is equal to or greater than 6%. Indications for measurement of coagulation factor activity assays can fall under three categories. These include diagnostic, prognostic, and therapeutic indications. Since hemophilia A and B are clinically indistinguishable from each other, it is important to make an accurate diagnosis of hemophilia based on coagulation factor assays. In addition, based upon baseline factor activity level, the patient is classified into mild, moderate, and severe hemophilia. Patients with severe hemophilia are at a higher risk of spontaneous hemorrhage and therefore are managed with prophylactic infusions of coagulation factor concentrates to prevent bleeding. This is also known as prophylaxis. Finally, accurate measurement of coagulation factor levels after infusion of clotting factor concentrates is important in order to be able to provide cost-effective factor replacement therapy. Next, we will review the one-stage and chromogenic assays. The one-stage assay is the most commonly used assay in the United States. Patient plasma containing all the clotting factors, except the factor that is being tested, like factor VIII, which may be reduced or absent, is initially mixed with factor VIII deficient plasma. Coagulation is initiated by addition of a contact activator and time to clot formation is measured. 
the endpoint is typically detected using either optical or mechanical endpoint detection systems. The contact activator may be silica, kaolin, or elagic acid based. In the chromogenic factor 8 assay, also known as the two stage assay, the main rate limiting step is the factor 8 level present in the test plasma. In stage 1, reagents containing factor 10 and activated factor 9 with or without thrombin are added to test plasma. This mixture activates factor 10. In the second stage of the assay, the activated factor 10 cleaves a chromogenic substrate. The color generated is proportional to the factor 8 activity in the patient plasma and is read photometrically. It is important to note that the source of factor 10 in the reagent can be of human origin or bovine origin, and this makes a difference in whether the particular chromogenic assay can be used to measure factor 8 inhibitors in patients who are treated with a drug called emicizumab, also known as Hemlibra. We will address this in a subsequent slide. In the chromogenic factor 9 assay, the rate limiting step is the factor 9 activity present in the test plasma. In the first stage, reagents containing calcium, phospholipid, activated factors 11 and 8 are added to the test plasma. This generates activated factor 9 and subsequent activation of factor 10. This leads to cleavage of the chromogenic substrate, which again is photometrically measured as in the chromogenic factor 8 assay. Some features to compare the one-stage assay with the chromogenic assay are shown on this slide. The references cited at the end of this presentation provide a very good discussion of the assays. There are advantages and disadvantages to each assay, some of which are listed here. One major disadvantage of the one-stage assay is the high interlaboratory variation as demonstrated in proficiency testing exercises. There is less variation with the chromogenic assay. The standard of care for management of hemophilia in general and severe hemophilia in particular is to provide prophylaxis. This means regular intravenous administration of coagulation factor concentrates in a preventive fashion to prevent bleeding. Given the different half-lives of factor 8 and factor 9, frequency of infusions may vary from 3 per week for factor 8 to twice weekly for factor 9. This frequency has been reduced to variable degrees with the availability of modified recombinant factor 8 concentrates to extend their half-lives. Whether one uses a standard half-life or an extended half-life concentrate, the goal is to maintain trough factor levels of greater than 1%. In order to achieve this goal, post-infusion pharmacokinetic studies are typically performed by serial measurements of factor levels after infusion of a dose of factor concentrate. The infusion doses are then adjusted to achieve a trough factor level of greater than 1%. Next we will discuss a case illustrating the importance of the type of contact activator used in the one-stage assay and its effect on measurement of factor 9. A young patient with hemophilia B was initiated on an extended half-life factor 9 concentrate. Following the standard practice, pharmacokinetic study was performed to determine the optimal dose and frequency of factor infusions. In this patient, his trough or pre-infusion factor 9 level was 5% and a sample obtained approximately one hour after the infusion was 80%. The patient was retested using a different laboratory and therefore a different reagent set. He had experienced no unexpected bleeding complications while on prophylactic infusions of his factor 9 concentrate. The laboratory data on repeat testing looked quite different. 
His baseline factor, 9, was less than 1%, and one hour after infusion of the same dose of his extended half-life factor 9 concentrate revealed a suboptimal peak. Based on those results, the local hemophilia center had planned to increase the dose of the factor 9 concentrate. However, they communicated with our laboratory prior to doing so. It was discovered that the contact activator used in their laboratory was a kaolin-based contact activator, which has been shown to significantly underestimate the true factor 9 activity level for this particular extended half-life concentrate. Prior to increasing the dose of the patient's factor 9 concentrate, we advised that the factor assays be repeated using the appropriate silica-based contact activator. And this confirmed the original pharmacokinetic studies results and therefore the dosage of the factor 9 concentrate did not need to be increased. This case demonstrates one of the disadvantages with one stage assay due to different contact activators. It would be important for laboratories to know which contact activator is appropriate for which extended half-life factor concentrate. This is a very complex task since laboratories do not always know which factor concentrate a patient be, is being treated with. Using a chromogenic factor assay will likely overcome this limitation since the chromogenic assays perform well in the large majority of the factor concentrates. In the second illustrative case, a similar pharmacokinetic study was done on a patient with severe hemophilia A, who had just switched to a new modified recombinant factor VIII. The patient received approximately 30 units per kilogram of the new modified recombinant factor VIII. The dose was calculated to achieve a post-infusion target of approximately 60%. However, when measured, the one-stage assay the post-infusion level was only 30%. When the same plasma sample was used to measure factor VIII using the chromogenic factor VIII assay, results were markedly different, and indeed, the dosage was accurately calculated to achieve the intended target. So for this particular modified recombinant factor VIII concentrate, the chromogenic assay was more accurate than the one-stage assay. The potential consequence of inaccurate measurement of clotting factor concentrates include underestimation of factor levels, which may lead to overdosing of the factor concentrate, increased cost, and an increased risk of thrombotic complications. On the other hand, overestimation of true factor level may result in potential underdosing of the factor concentrate and increasing the risk of bleeding and accompanying morbidity. Next, we will talk about the effect of inaccurate measurement of coagulation factor levels on the diagnosis of hemophilia. For patients with severe hemophilia A, there is generally no discrepancy between the one stage and the chromogenic factor VIII assays. However, a discrepancy between the one stage and chromogenic factor VIII and factor IX assays in patients with non-severe hemophilia has recently been observed. Up to 30% of patients with hemophilia A may have a discordant result. Most of the time the one-stage assay result is higher than the chromogenic result, but it has been observed that the chromogenic assay result may also be higher. In selected cases, either the one-stage assay or the chromogenic assay result may be completely normal thus potentially missing the diagnosis of hemophilia. This discrepancy was observed in patients with very specific factor VIII gene mutations. More recently, this phenomenon was described in patients with hemophilia B as well. Next, we will discuss how emicizumab, a newly FDA-approved medication for use in patients with hemophilia A with or without inhibitors, affects the factor VIII assays. This cartoon demonstrates the mechanism of action of emicizumab. As shown in the upper panel, 
Normally, factor 9 needs to activate factor 10 for optimal clot formation. And the role of factor 8 is to help in this process. Thus, it acts as a cofactor for this activation step. In patients with hemophilia who have a deficiency of factor 8 or have developed inhibitor antibodies against factor 8, activation of factor 10 is either delayed or completely inhibited. In order to bypass this block, a medication called emicizumab, which is a bispecific antibody, was developed to function just like factor 8 does. As shown in the lower panel, emicizumab functions just like factor 8, allowing factor 9 to activate factor 10, thus facilitating clot formation. This medication was recently FDA approved for use in patients with hemophilia A with or without factor 8 inhibitors. Thus, more and more patients with hemophilia A are being treated with this medication. It is important to know because emicizumab interferes with the one-stage coagulation factor 8 assay. Recall that the one-stage assay is based on the activated partial thromboplastin time test, also known as the APTT. The relationship between the APTT clotting time and estimation of clotting factor 8 activity assay is such that the longer the APTT, the lower the measured factor 8. Conversely, the shorter the APTT, the higher the measured factor 8 will be. In this experiment shown in this slide, factor 8 deficient plasma was spiked with progressively increasing concentration of emicizumab. Although I have not shown the data, the APTT progressively shortens and this results in an artifactual increase in the measured factor 8 level. In addition, measurement of the factor 8 activity using a chromogenic assay with human reagents, as shown in red color, will also overestimate the true factor 8 level in the test plasma. However, as shown in green, when using a chromogenic assay with bovine reagents, one does not see this false elevation of factor 8 activity. In conclusion, the one-stage factor 8 activity assay and the chromogenic factor 8 activity assay using human substrate results in an artifactual elevation of factor 8 activity in the presence of emicizumab. The implications of these findings are important for detection of factor 8 inhibitors using the Bethesda assay. Using the one-stage factor 8 assay and chromogenic factor 8 assay with human reagents will result in a false negative or lower estimates of true Bethesda titers. For patients on emicizumab, it is very important to ensure that the laboratory performing factor 8 inhibitor titers in patients on emicizumab are using bovine substrates in their chromogenic factor 8 assays. In conclusion, options for monitoring new modified extended half-life recombinant factor concentrates may require one-stage assays with specific contact activators. Alternatively, chromogenic assays will provide more accurate post-infusion test results. Selected patients with mild hemophilia A may be missed with either the one-stage or the chromogenic assay, but more commonly, the disease severity may be misclassified. In this situation, if a male patient with a clear bleeding disorder has a normal one-stage factor VIII activity assay, one should consider follow-up testing with the chromogenic factor VIII activity assay. Finally, Bethesda titer assessments in patients on emicizumab should always have testing performed using chromogenic factor VIII assay based on bovine reagents. Thank you for your attention.